Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron Christensen, and this is Horror 101 with Dr. AC, a gathering place for fellow fiends the world over to discuss all things freaky and frightening. If you want to be part of the conversation, and I hope you do, I invite you to like this video, subscribe to the channel, maybe go back and check out some of our previous episodes, leave a comment, and most importantly, let us know the fright flicks you'd like to discuss in the future. That kind of connection is exactly what we're looking for, and it really does make a difference. We're all about sharing the scare, and we want to hear from you. The early 1980s were a magical time for fans of horror, sci-fi, and fantasy fare at the cinema. Tonight, we'll take a look at two franchises birthed by two mighty masters of the art form at different points on the budgetary spectrum. Having proven his box office clout in the director's chair, Hollywood titan Steven Spielberg began testing his powers as a producer. Armed with a wicked script by Chris Columbus and special effects by future Oscar winner Chris Wallace, Spielberg tapped his Twilight Zone pal Joe Dante to helm a sparkling combination of monster movie and comic hijinks called Gremlins. The inhabitants of small-town Kingston Falls are inundated with mischievous creatures after a well-meaning inventor brings home an unusual life form to his son as a Christmas present. Gremlins was a smash hit and, along with another Spielberg project, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, inspired the MPAA to create the PG-13 rating, based on the fact that these movies were deemed just a little too intense for younger audiences. 1990 saw an even bigger budgeted sequel, with Rick Baker handling the creature effects and Dante's love for creature features, political commentary, and Looney Tunes cartoons realized to their fullest. Further down the Tinseltown food chain, after years of toiling in the low-budget trenches, producer-director Charles Band was looking to create his own studio. Empire Pictures was in its nascent stages when Ghoulies began its development journey. Director Luca Bercovici and co-writer Jeremy Levy conjured a reliable old dark house with dark family secrets yarn, complete with satanic rituals and possessed souls, but the secret ingredient was John Carl Beekler's rubber latex monsters as our dark magician's evil familiars. The success of Gremlins inspired Band's infamous toilet monster ad campaign and they'll get you in the end tagline, and the results were a box office bonanza at least by independent film standards. Several sequels followed, and Empire Pictures became a legendary success story that gave way to bands Full Moon Pictures that still survives to this day. I'm super excited to chat about these four films and perhaps a few others. And so I'm going to bring in my awesome panel right now. And let's say hello to Dodd Alley, Kevin Matthews, and Derek Carey. And we are here to chat about Gremlins, celebrating its 40th anniversary, coming out from 1984, as well as its sequel from 1990. We're also going to be talking about Ghoulies from 1985. Not 84, by the way, 1985. And its sequel, which followed two years later, 1987. We also might talk about the other Ghoulies films. Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Robin. Thank you. Uh, wow, what a what a great panel we have today. I am I'm really excited to chat about these these movies. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with you, Derek? Can you tell us the first time, uh, like, what your first experience was with the uh, Gremlins, the original 1984? Yeah, I'm one of the. As you can tell, I'm an old. I grew up uh, going to the theater and seeing Gremlins. My my mom took me and my brother Shane when we were quite young. And from the moment I saw it, I was absolutely enamored and obsessed with it. I watched it every opportunity I could. I, I've been a monster kid since I was way little. My bro, my dad introduced me to like universal horror movies and uh, you know, like Dracula and Frankenstein. So I was completely into horror movies. And also, obviously, a kid of the 80s into stuff like He-Man and G.I. Joe and all the stuff we were just thrown at uh, via TV and all that stuff. And Gremlins just fit right into like a bisection of those two things because um, it, it was so funny, but at the same time, so kind of like in your face nihilistic <laughs> in a way. Gremlins has just always been a thing in my life. 
So when I was little, when we went to the theater, I remember looking at my brother going, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, Kevin, how about you? Although I am also old enough to have seen it in cinemas over your way, I wasn't old enough to see Gremlins when it released over here in the UK because it was initially classified as a 15. So that was unfortunate. I'd seen all the marketing. I think they used a lot of clips of the, the box opening slightly with the little hands coming out. Uh, you saw some clips of Gizmo in the uh, the car whizzing around. Looked like the perfect combination of kids' fare and complete practical effects, horror, goodness, and I couldn't get to see it. So what I did, <laughs> uh, when I was 12 or 13, I got the sticker album for Gremlins, and it's one of the two sticker albums I've ever came that close to completing. Much to... <laughs> probably the potential bankruptcy of my parents. <laughs> um, so I, I saw every image, I had full layouts. Obviously the final pages were kind of gizmo in the car and it was amazing. I couldn't get enough. And I finally saw it still on VHS when I think it was my uncle had a copy and I was, I was just over the moon when I finally got to see it. And it lived up to my expectations and more. And how about you, Dad? I was a little too young to see it in the theater. Um, Gremlins is one of those films, um, and it has that history behind it because it inspired the PG-13 rating. Uh, <laughs> my mom brought it home because it was stamped with the PG rating. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I think it's one of the first films that made uh, a horror fanatic out of me uh, because I'd never seen anything like it. Like, as mentioned before, there was comedies sort of combined with... Uh, elements of horror and some splatter gore. I, I however, I think it, it didn't really traumatize me very much. I think that honor went to the first film I saw in the theater, which was Return to Oz. We could do a whole other episode on that. <laughs> yeah, though, no, the first time I was ever exposed to it was uh, when my mom brought it home on VHS from the local video store before Blockbuster. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before um, as as a child. Yeah, I, I think it's a great kind of like progression from. You know, like uh, like you said, Derek, the 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 kind of monster kid love where you know it was it was the rub I mean, basically they are rubber monsters. You know, they're uh, Chris Wayless, who would later go on and win an Oscar for The Fly design and and uh, made these animatronics. But as you said, Dot, we've got like it's a little gooier than we we're you know used to back in the the sixties and seventies. Obviously, there's that blender moment where you're just like, wow. Um, you just, and the, and the microwave, you know, it's like all these, these great moments of just horror, just so everybody's clear. If you haven't seen this, you know, 40 year old movie, I apologize, but we're going to be talking spoilers today. So just be advised. Phoebe Cates's monologue about Santa. I remember like I was there with my <laughs> sister, my younger sister. I think we might have still been at the point where Santa was a thing. Uh, I, I I think I was in the know, but she was not. And I was like, A, this is the most horrifying monologue I've ever heard. Also, you can't say there's no Santa Claus. You're ruining it for my sister. <laughs> One of the greatest moments in all of cinema. To this day, it is a jaw dropper. Well, I was wondering about that. Was that supposed to be played for laughs or was it supposed to be serious as a car crash <laughs> when they were making the film? I think it's supposed to be taken seriously that like it's okay. a moment of uh, character development and, you know, talking about like why Christmas is not always the happiest time of the year, you know, not to get too deep, but I mean, like, you know, like it's also a great source of depression for a large part of the population, but that's, that's exactly it. This movie is such a balance of comedy and horror and like disturbing, like, you know, we have our Mr. Potter character, you know, in uh, the Polly Holiday part, she gets a fate that you're like, I don't know if that was appropriate. You know, like it feels, everything feels just a little darker and meaner than you expect it to be. Well, originally Joe Dante, when he got the script, this was intended to be a horror movie. Mm -hmm. I This was not, and he's come out in interviews and said this, not intended right outright to be a kid, children's movie. But because of his sensibilities, I mean, obviously coming off the heels of the howling, you would totally see that a uh, um, horror movie with little monsters that terrorize the town. Perfect, perfect for Joe Dante. His sensibilities, and it would be showcased to its extreme in part two. Right. 
our, our tongue-in-cheek slapstick, you know, comedy. For me, this movie is the perfect kind of gateway into horror. As yes. you were kind of saying, like the Monster Squad, yep. Fred mm-hmm. Decker's Monster Squad, and this movie are kind of like, for kids of the 80s, I, I, I felt, and this is why I think a lot of us that grew up in that generation were just like really glommed onto this movie, is that it's just goopy enough that you get the interest there to explore more because the gremlins are very vile evil characters there's no doubts about it well it doesn't dante credit spielberg with the idea of uh, keeping gizmo as gizmo uh, yep. i think the original intention was gizmo would become stripe or one of the gremlins uh, with them so spielberg has his eye on the uh, the wider appeal and the marketing potential <laughs> and uh, makes that which is a bonus for the film i think dante coming in with his darker, slightly twisted sensibilities, Spielberg polishing some of the edges, uh, softening things, and keeping it at that age. Because when you're discussing the uh, great monologue from Phoebe Cates, I was thinking it is in line with that age that it was very much aimed at. Because I recognise this most with my youngest daughter, when she got to an age where kids start to suspect there's not Santa, but they like presents. Mm-hmm. So they don't want to come out and say, Go rock the boat. Yep. Yeah, I know there's no Santa. <laughs> I know I don't need presents yet. They still want the presents. So then you get the, you get the, there's a Santa, there's a Santa. You spend a year or two with the, well, all the parents help Santa because you can't get everyone at once. Right. So eventually, years later, <laughs> no, here's some vouchers, get a sweater. <laughs> I, th- I think that's, you know, in line with where they were aiming things for the demographic and that is between Dante and and Spielberg and uh, the, the script from Chris Columbus. I think they all come together perfectly this time around and then the sequel will get to with uh, much more Danteisms well, I feel. Well my understanding is that um, Chris Columbus's script was darker as well like it was mm-hmm. it was a straight up horror movie like you know mom did not make it to the end of the movie you know things like that and dante and spielberg kind of took it a little bit lighter like they took some of those those darker edges off but again dante's sense of humor is what kind of makes it a quote family movie like you could do you could do this as a straight ahead you know monster movie and you could t- you could dial things back a bit and make it a you know like a PG horror, but it's it's the fact that Dante has all that energy to it, and it's that off kilter energy. When you look at what Chris Wayless was doing in terms of the animatronics, like it feels like a huge leap forward from anything we've seen prior to that. You know, I feel like the the stuff we were seeing in like um, Star Wars specifically. Uh, you were talking about Joe Dante earlier, and I was I was looking at his filmography. You know, the thing is, like, not to get too much into auteur theory with with Joe Dante, but but let's, <laughs> I, I, yeah, but let's. I, I just noticed that he has that affinity for old monster movies, and so in a movie like Gremlins and some of the other movies he's done, like The Burbs, uh, even Small Soldiers. He likes to, in matinee as well, he likes to play on that theme of um, a quaint community getting invaded <laughs> by yeah. something that's foreign, um, it, you know, particularly with Gizmo coming from, from Chinatown <laughs> and these things coming from uh, other places. And I just, I, I, I happen to notice that theme is really prominent here in Gremlins. And I noticed that kind of is something that Joe Dante has toyed with in the past. And something I just I just recently found out was that Spielberg came in and made, you know, a, an executive decision at the end uh, with regard to the design of Gizmo uh, that he was uh, Chris Wales had originally envisioned him as just kind of brown all over. And Spielberg was the one like adding the white qualities to it. And he took the hair off the ears to make him a little more goofy friendly. Like, I guess this was like right at the 11th hour and Wales is like, seriously, like we got to do this now. <laughs> Spielberg is, is no dummy. Like he knows how to reach. And especially at that time in his career, he knows how to tap into that audience specifically toward the, uh, the family friendly where everybody can come and see the movie. Moms and dads had a few bits of explaining to do on the way home. 
and probably had to rock their kids to sleep, uh, a couple of them. I, I think uh, this is around the time when Spielberg was kind of a, a production powerhouse. He had done Poltergeist and had started producing E.T., but this was kind of like the beginning of his genre stuff. He'd done I Want to Hold Your Hand and Use Cars. So he was kind of like yeah. just playing around with the producing thing. But this was the one, I think, that really just pushed everything into the, the forefront uh, as a producer. More so than Spielberg. The other good thing about Dante is he knows that if you're into a movie, because the plot holes in Gremlins are ridiculous, you know, they can't get wet what is the majority of snow made up of things like that. <laughs> uh, I, I think he knows that um, whether or not you see the ridiculousness in the script or whether you see the joins, it doesn't matter once you're sucked in. Because as a growing film fan, from a kid who loved Gremlins and all the gloopiness and the fun of it, every time I watched it, I could spot little things that never detracted from my enjoyment. But, the, you know, it's quite obvious to spot the uh, puppeteer behind the Christmas tree. Quite obvious to spot the top of the puppeteer's head uh, behind the microwave gremlin getting backed up. And on the on the old pan and scan version, when Billy puts uh, Gizmo on the bathroom sink to clean his wounds, you see a switch it for the dolls. <laughs> and none, none of those things ever had me thinking, oh, well, but, you know, this is terrible. I'm seeing how they've put this together. They all had me if anything, loving it even more, knowing the kind of blood, sweat and tears that went into creating this absolute madness that was on screen. And yeah, the and Dan Dante knows that. Yeah, the energy of, of both of the movies. Um, I, I think number two, obviously, was way more informed by Looney Tunes, and we haven't got to that, so I don't want to go too far ahead yet. But the the theater scene in, in Gremlins... Or the watching just, Snow White... Oh God, that see when I was a kid, I just remember thinking, uh, just like there was just so much to take in during the bar scene and the theater scene. And I've always had a lot of um affinity towards things that like movies that aren't perfect. Like you can see the scenes and the special effects, and what you're talking about, Kevin, is like exactly what endears me to these kind of like little mini monster movies that use practical effects and and puppets. There's just an energy to that. That uh, being a kid that grew up watching like Sesame Street <laughs> and 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 the Muppets and and things like that, that this again was that convergence yep, of yep. so mm. many things. Joe Dante and Steven Spielberg were so brilliant about how they put this thing together and marketed it not just towards because it is a mass market product not just towards the the adults but to the kids because when let's be honest when you're a little kid you're not looking for that guy behind the christmas tree you're not looking right, for the hand right. up the ass of the puppet you're not okay. looking for any of that stuff okay i i just remember the energy and just remember like being enamored with gizmo and being enamored with the 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 freaking uh gremlin with the popcorn box over his head and all that other crazy ass shit it just man it these movies are just wonderful absolutely wonderful go ahead Dad. yeah and derek derek what you're saying there's something just magical to me even today as just as much as when i was a kid something magical about the tangible um you know you can see gizmos fur you know if he were here you could pet him <laughs> he's like a puppy uh you know the gore and the goo that we mentioned you can see the pus bubbles uh, there's nothing here that's been computer generated where you're going oh that's fake people made these things with their bare hands and there's just something so cool about that that i still love to this day well, kind to you, what you were actually, what all of you have just been saying, this idea of the practical effects is the idea that it doesn't matter. Uh, like the kids will talk to the puppet face. They don't talk. I mean, you could be standing there doing this. They're going to talk to the puppet. They're not going to talk to the puppeteer. They're going to talk to the puppet. They want to invest in it. And I think that is one of the things that gets lost in this world of CGI, where everything feels like it's of a world but there isn't that sense of the tangible, the thing that you can actually connect with. It's something that I, I, I wish filmmakers would, you know, kind of like remember when they're putting it together. It's not about, like you said, Kevin, like they don't care. In fact, there's something kind of fun about knowing how you did the trick because you feel like you're in on it now. 
Like when you're a kid and you can figure out how the magician did that, that doesn't make the magician any less cool. It's like, wow, you made that happen. That's awesome. And now I know how we did that. We're in on it together. And I feel like that is what this movie does is it asks the audience to meet them in the middle and say, okay, we're going to give you this. You give us your imagination and we'll have something wonderful together. Something I just found out, speaking of the effects, is that apparently uh, Joe Dante's idea was that he was going to dress up monkeys in the Gremlins outfits. And they the test, the te the way the test went down is that they put this monkey in a gremlin outfit and he basically just tore the thing to shreds, like shit all over the place. And Chris Wales and Joe Dante are looking at it, and Joe Dante turns to Chris Wales and goes, So puppets. Uh, <laughs> it's horrible. I hope they filmed any of that. <laughs> I'm sure they were planning it like for a camera test. But yeah, I was like, wow, yeah, monkeys. That's a that's a and let's and the idea that like you were gonna have an entire crew, like a theater full of monkeys wearing gremlins. I'm like, that is a recipe for disaster, my friends. There's no uh, way they could have coordinated. Couldn't that. have been done. But it was. I love that that story exists. I was gonna say was was like PETA a big watchdog group on movie <laughs> sets back in the eighties. <laughs> They like it. They're humans. It's great. Uh, anyway, so we've touched on the sequel a couple of times already. So let's go ahead and just kind of lean into it. Uh, so 1990 rolls around six years later. Basically, they came to Joe Dante and said, we want to do a sequel and you can do anything you want. And it absolutely feels like Joe Dante went, anything? <laughs> they said anything. And he went, OK, then, because it's political. You know, it's got all this Looney Tunes comedy to it. Uh, it, it feels like you just dived into Joe Dante's brain and came out and, you know, we're swimming around in the soup for a while. Yeah. This one was definitely a, uh, Joe Dante brainchild. It reminded me a lot, Aaron, of the, uh, segment he did on the twilight zone mm. <laughs> as I was watching this. Uh, it, to me, it was like a feature length Tex Avery cartoon. I did get to see gremlins too in cinemas. If memory serves me correct. I think it came out around about the same thing as Back to the Future 3. That's that's how I remember it. Because, again, I'd already bankrupted my parents with the sticker album. I was keen to see uh, Gremlins 2. And I had a friend who overruled me and said, let's see Back to the Future 3. So I could only get probably one cinema trip a month. So I was like, well, okay, then we'll go. Next weekend, he comes to my door. I've got to see Gremlins 2. Do you want to come? I was like, oh, damn it. So... Had to give the really big eyes to my mum and sort of <laughs> so many household chores. So I got to see Gremlins too. I loved it then for the absolute insanity of it and all the creativity and the fun. I love it now today, genuinely, as one of the greatest sequels ever made. When people say films like Blazing Saddles won't be made again or Soul Man, I'm like, films like Gremlins 2 are the films that won't be made again. Because, as you say, the studio were like, we need someone to give us a sequel to this. You can do anything you want. And Joe Dante went, as is famously spoofed in the great Key and Peele sketch, <laughs> well, let's yes. just put everything in it that comes to my mind. It is anarchy in a way you don't see in mainstream movies that are aiming to be big popular hits. I don't think it... it did that well in the cinema release. It certainly didn't live up to the projections they would have wanted. Right. But uh, I think people who love it really love it. And I'll always really love it. For me, it didn't hit me the way the first one did. Right away when I was young, I think I was looking for something else. But as I grew, I absolutely adore this movie. It is, as you said, Kevin, just pure anarchy. And um, you got to wonder how much like influence this had on like the meta film culture like mm. obviously people had seen this growing up and there's so much of gremlins too in a lot of things that would come afterward that it's almost impossible to say that the, you know well this was a flop and this was a bomb and this wasn't nearly as good as the first one because it's just it's absolutely everywhere i mean you had like Hulk Hogan is in this thing. Yeah, you, ha you, you have cross dressing gremlins. You have spider gremlins. You, you have it. Just it, it's literally kitchen sink. Throw everything at it, 
And as an adult, it is a movie that I go back to quite often. But when it came out, I, I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it on VHS. I had to, I have to be honest and say I was a bit underwhelmed by it. But man, you know what? When you're young, sometimes you're dumb. You don't quite see what, <laughs> what you need to be seeing. And man, I love this movie now. Well, and I wish I, wish I could have seen this as a younger viewer. Because like Billy in the movie, you know, like I I had grown up a bit and I was watching it through adult eyes. And I think I was kind of, you know, going, huh, this is, this feels like a bit much. It feels a bit, it doesn't feel as, you know, kind of like streamlined as the, as the previous film. And so I think I was just taking, taking it seriously when I, this is a film that is not asking to be taken seriously at all. It is like, here, I'm having fun. I hope you are having fun too. And if you're not, I'm sorry, but I'm going to keep doing all of the things I want to do. Uh, I hadn't seen this since it came out in 1990. And I revisited it, you know, over the holidays after I saw Gremlins for my annual Christmas viewing. And I was like, you know what? This movie sits better with me now than it did when it first came out. And I, I would invite folks to go back and revisit it that, you know, perhaps thought it, it didn't, land with them the first time around because it really is i absolutely agree that it's one of the greatest kind of like 80s slash 90s sequels in that it goes bigger in every single regard like it is the t2 of of gremlins world i just think it's one of the greatest sequels folks <laughs> because not not only does dante acknowledge uh the ridiculousness Right, the rules. What they're, what they're working with, yeah, the rules. Uh, it also brilliantly skewers, you know, Dante's not a fan of sequels. So, you know, every sequel wants to be giving you what you like from the first film, but a bit more, but not too much that you get tired out by it. He knows that. And that is the, the way things escalate on screen. It can be a little bit almost tiring as you watch it it's so much <laughs> all the time. But he's he's really playing into that. And I think that's why I love it so much, because he delivers, on the one hand, kind of what they would want from him. He puts in everything that he wants. And it has that brilliant, uh, as, as Derek said, there's the meta layering, but also underneath it all is the comment on, well, this is what sequels do. You know, right. this, this is why you shouldn't really put all your faith in sequels and all your money into them because this is what you want from them. And the whole, like his kind of political leanings are on display as well, because he punches, he punches at some pretty big targets. Like he's taken on basically Donald Trump and Ted Turner in one persona, which, and I love John Glover as uh, Mr. Clamp. He's such an, a, an adorable villain. Like we genuinely like him. He just feels like a kid. He feels like he's misguided. He doesn't feel like this guy who's trying to, he's not like a Mr. Potter. He just has too much money. He doesn't know what to do with it. So he just keeps coming up with, with zany ideas. I love, I love that shot where he's just kind of in his office, just kind of, kind of almost kind of like this, doing this little hopscotchy thing around his office, not knowing <laughs> what to do. And he gets on with his secretary. Oh, let's, let's do a memo. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> almost like a little boy with too much power. And, and yeah, I, I agree with you. John Glover was like the quintessential, uh, had that quintessential uh, shit eating grin of the late eighties, early nineties, especially in Scrooge. <laughs> well, and the, the idea of the inventing, actually, I, we kind of jumped over Hoyt Axton's character, um, from the original, but I think, like, I think Hoyt Axton is so likable in that original, that first film. Like, he's he's completely well meaning. He's not. He's clearly not a great inventor, but he's got good ideas. And I think this was another one of these good ideas. I'll bring this thing home to yep. my son, and he'll love it. Uh, Kevin, in your review, uh, I think you talked about the. Dogs are for a lifetime, not just for Christmas. I stole your line, but if you don't mind just kind of elaborating on that. Well, it's basically a, a comedy horror riff on that message, isn't it? You know, um, the, the guilty parent bringing home a pet that they'll leave with their, their child and say, oh, you know, remember just to feed it every so often and look after it. That's <laughs> your business. And the kid's excited on Christmas, but then it's like, 
Oh, the dog's hungry. Have some sausages. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I like that as well. That's at the, the heart of, of Gremlins. Well, and kind of the, the uh, a connecting thread from Gremlins 1 to Gremlins 2, in addition to having Billy and uh, Phoebe Cates' character coming back again as well, we get to see the Futtermans. Yeah, D- Dick Miller and uh, Jackie Joseph, uh, because... I think they get some real showcase moments in Gremlins too. They're just very, very funny. Uh, Joe Dante always puts Dick Miller in all of his films, and yeah, he really got to be front and center in this one. That was a lot of fun. I, I actually really enjoy. I mean, obviously, Dick Miller is quite amazing in everything he goes in, but I like the progression of the Billy and uh, Phoebe Cates character in this, and it, it and it parallels the first one in in rather interesting ways because I mean, in the first one, Billy's kind of like this dreamer that's stuck in a small town um and and phoebe cates is somebody that really like obviously loves billy and and wants to support him but uh doesn't quite have a lot of dreams herself so she works a lot of service jobs in order to get by and in this one again she's working a service job to support this dreamer who's who's not necessarily getting it right (laughs) so it's just like perfectly written i i I love uh just the little ties that are between these two movies because it's it's not just a well let's throw these people together and whatever happens happens there everyone's here just for the gremlins anyway no they actually thought this thing through this is a really smart little movie not little movie it's huge but i mean (laughs) you know what i mean in the uh the gremlins department rick baker took over for uh chris whalis for this this sequel and oh my gosh you know we have so much more gremlin action not just in terms of gremlins but in terms of what they are able to do we have the spider gremlin we have uh christopher lee shows up as kind of like one of the scientists (laughs) that just happens to have like they've just rented office space in the building which i think is hilarious he's got all of these things going on that the gremlins get in and they start drinking the potions and they turn into different versions of gremlins you know, and I think that's where Joe Dante's like going, yes, we could do that. And we could do that. And we could do that. I do have to throw in there. I mean, Christopher Lee, uh, this is why I keep IMDb open while I do these things to catch these <laughs> little details. I didn't realize his character's name was Dr. Catheter. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that he comes strolling out with his, uh, with the invasion of the body snatchers pod. Christopher Lee apparently wanted to play it a little more wacky. We've already got that covered. We really kind of need you to bring your Christopher Lee thing. But I think he's delightful in this. He seems to be having a really good time. Everybody seems to be having a really good time. And I think that's kind of infectious as well. I feel like there has to be a moment where you have to give props to all the supporting characters that are in this thing that were so endearing. And I'm going to say my favorite performance in this was Tony Randall as the voice of the Brainiac. (laughs) Um, I never realized watching this how hilarious that bougie accent is that he does. <laughs> um, almost like the way he pronounces the vowels. Well, right. And you got Robert Prosky is kind of like this uh, fading horror host uh, who really wants to be a newscaster. That has the darkest moment in this movie where the brain gremlin like literally pulls out a gun and shoots another gremlin like in the face what what who is this movie for what the hell again joe dante <laughs> does not care well and i love the fact that phoebe kate starts to do her lincoln birthday speech as you said kevin like commenting on the first movie this is the sequel so we gotta have another holiday monologue yeah uh, and it gives you a line if you ever embarrass yourself at any party and you just turn around and say, was that civilized? No, fun, but not civilized. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also really like Robert Picardo. And, uh, you know, the 80s as a child slash teen between Jessica Rabbit and Haviland Morris. Mm. It's it's a problem suddenly having a longing for perhaps predatory redheaded females. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they all contributed to various uh psychological scars over the years you're not going to knock over anything i'd love it if you just stand up so we can see your your sweater in oh. its full glory uh there there we go my gremlins christmas sweater <laughs> and even i'd had it a while before i realized barney strung up on the lights is at the bottom <laughs> <bless him. laughs> that poor dog <laughs> I would just say I noticed on this viewing that there's uh, between Gremlins and Gremlins 2, there's the Breaking Bad connection. 
Jonathan Banks as the cop in Gremlins, and Dean Norris is one of the SWAT team members that comes at the end of Gremlins 2. Wow. So just a nice little Breaking Bad thread running through both coincidentally. Easter eggs that Joe Dante didn't even know were going to be yes. there. Yes. Yep. Well, uh, let us go ahead and uh, shift back in time from Gremlins 2 to 1985 when Ghoulies came out. And I will, I will make my confession on camera right now that I thought Ghoulies came out in 1984. And I thought we were going to be celebrating two 40th anniversaries of these two franchises. But it turns out that Ghoulies came out in the January of 1985. So we just missed it. Uh, however, it is one of those movies that, you know, the similarity of the names and the fact that they have little creatures, one might be forgiven for thinking that Ghoulies is just a Gremlins knockoff. But turns out that uh, it was being made at the same time that Gremlins was being made. And when you watch the two movies together, they're absolutely not the same movie at all. Like, in fact, in some ways, the Ghoulies creatures aren't even the stars of the show. Like, it really isn't about them at all. They just happen to be there. And I'm not, they don't really do a ton, either plot-wise or, you know, in terms of screen action. Like, they're just kind of there. However, there is that amazing one-sheet poster that got everybody into the theater. And so, you know, they kind of became the stars de facto. And then later on, they would become the stars of the franchise, obviously. Let me go back around again. Uh, Dodd, when did you see Ghoulies for the first time? I think I saw Ghoulies, it, it, despite its release date, I think I saw it years after I saw Gremlins. And, and yeah, I think I rented it uh, un with the understanding that it was a Gremlins knockoff, because here I am, a preteen, I imagine is how old I was, and there's the VHS cover of a toilet monster. And what's more appealing to somebody that age than toilet humor and monsters? So, uh, yeah, it was the cover art. I think that I think that sold a lot of kids my age back then was to because you know we're all wondering is he going to bite somebody's ass <laughs> if you rent this movie? And so yeah, I think that's when I picked it up. It was definitely after Gremlins, even though I had to wait for that to to be on video, but not too far after. I was already at that stage of scouring the vhs shelves and looking for stuff that would draw me in so ghoulies was there you know things like just the cover of was it mutant with wings hauser mm -hmm. as a as a kid you couldn't resist that cover and the trailer was on everything so definitely on vhs i was probably hoping for something that was exactly like gremlins and it was not no <laughs> <laughs> we will get into what it was in a second yeah. uh derek uh, i'm gonna apologize before I start talking, because uh, <laughs> anybody that knows me knows that I have a deep love for Ghoulies. Ghoulies is one of my top five favorite movies of all time. And people would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> and I wouldn't blame them for that. But my earliest memory of Ghoulies is literally because I, I is the VHS box art, because I would always go into the video store, go right back to the horror section, because you always had that horror VHS alcove. And I would sit and look at every single cover, read the back of the covers, think about what those movies were. And I, my mom let me rent it right away. I, cause I was just like, I need to see this movie. And I would then make her rent it almost weekly. If I, <laughs> if I could, I, I, I loved it so much. And um, it's, it's one of those movies that eventually over time became like comfort food for me. There was something about it as a burgeoning monster kid that obviously loved gremlins, liked the little gooey monsters. And you're totally dead on by this, uh, AC, is that it has really no ties to it other than the little tiny monsters and the marketing of the film. But this movie is so much darker than that. If you're a horror fan, this is definitely a horror movie. There's no qualms about it. There's Satanism. There, there's sacrifices. There's multiple deaths all over the place. And uh, the tone of the, the score, even though it's kind of like whimsical in a way, still very dark film. And uh, over, over time, I just like, if you walked into my house, I have like commissioned paintings of ghoulies. I have the soundtrack on vinyl. <laughs> I have it on VHS, a DVD <laughs> and Blu-ray. I have, I'm a, tad bit obsessed with it and i think it's one of those things like a lot of people with gremlins 
like when they were growing up, yeah, Gremlins might be that. For, for some reason, Ghoulies hit me in that way. And still, I could watch it literally every day and I would not be <laughs> upset about it. And that's why you're here, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Shout Factory. Shout Factory put out uh, this on Blu-ray uh, back in 2015, It and Ghoulies 2. And they've just recently been reissued um, from MVD on their Rewind collection. That was probably one of the first times I saw it because I thought that it was just going to be another Gremlins retread. And I was like, eh, you know, I'll get around to that. I'd rather just watch Gremlins again. But when watch, watching Ghoulies, I was like, oh, this is actually not what I was expecting. And I like it because it's so kind of emblematic of what Charles Band's Empire Pictures was to be for the throughout the 80s and, and 90s. It's rubber monsters. It's goofy characters. And it's a lot of like, you know, sorcery and done on a budget. And this was the film. Like the success of Ghoulies is what made Empire Pictures what it became like it, it allowed Charles band to become the, the Roger Corman of his day. The fact that this was so successful, I think because, because people loved gremlins and people wanted more gremlins. And so you put a gremlin like creature on the poster and put him in the commercials and audiences go. And even though it isn't gremlins, it's still pretty darn entertaining. And they really dug it and they went, oh, I want some more of this. You know, that's how Empire Pictures came to be. And Reanimator apparently came out just a few months later. And so that one-two punch of Ghoulies and Reanimator, you're like, okay, we're in. Yeah, as soon as I heard the music in the opening credits, before yeah. I even saw the name Band, I thought to myself, this sounds like something from a Full Moon Entertainment <laughs> production. So it almost felt like comfort food when I first heard that synthy music in the opening credits. Right. Richard Band. It Another is, band. yeah. See, it's it's <laughs> yeah. Charles's brother Richard doing that music, which he also did for Reanimator. Even though his Reanimator is very much like here's Psycho. If you're familiar with those movies from Empire, it absolutely is comfort food. You're like, oh, good, I'm in for a good time. I know exactly the kind of e movie goodness I'm gonna, I'm going to get. I think it, your enjoyment of it is going to be tied to whether or not you are into B movies. Mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of people shit on Ghoulies a lot and then mm -hmm. go to Ghoulies 2 and because Ghoulies 2 is a lot more mainstream friendly and not as dark as the first one. The stupid characters in this movie are entirely charming. You, Toad Boy and, and that freaking smarmy idiot that uh, is trying to constantly get laid. Those characters crack me the fuck up. Jack Nance. Yes. I, I, I've been such a David Lynch fan forever, and his performance is ridiculous, but at the same time, it's that, that typical Jack Nance, otherworldly, like he is definitely balls deep into this movie, and you believe that he is like, he is a goddamn wizard. Yep. <laughs> that, that first scene where you see him, uh, when they go to the dad's, uh, they they find his grave on the on the property, and he's he just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you're mm -hmm. like, who is this guy? What the hell is going on here? Uh, on the special features, uh, they talk about Michael Debar, who plays the the evil wizard. He talks about how you know he's playing this ridiculous, over the top character. But when you're acting opposite Jack Nance, mm -hmm. there's no such thing as being over the top. Like all you can do is just just try and keep up with Jack Nance's weirdness. And I think that's why those scenes play so well is that Jack Nance is able to kind of hold that space where anything can happen and normalcy goes right out the window. If we're in a world where Jack Nance can exist, anything can happen. Yeah, that finger power battle at the very end where they're oh, yeah. shooting lasers at each other or or demonic power lasers at each other. My God, it's so hilarious. I think I think that superimposed lightning was like a was like a, a locked in cliche on the canon films, the full moon films. It's something mm -hmm. another piece of comfort food for me. It's something I've enjoyed more over the years since. Uh, unlike Derek, I'll never you know fully love it and embrace it. And have a large tattoo of it on my back, but it's, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, 
I felt that way when I found uh, Spookies, which was kind of, uh, I don't know if it was similar time on video, but Ghoulies, every time you revisit Ghoulies, there is more to find. It's inventive. Uh, I think when I watched it as a teen, I didn't even understand some of it, even though it's not a complex plot. But the way they're playing it, um, when the character you know commands the Ghoulies to be invisible to everyone but him, I just thought people were being really stupid during the dinner sequence. And now you watch it, you're like, that's a great way of just having the ghoulies, you know, just being a bit ridiculous, again, mixing with the characters while they can't see them. So I like that. And unlike some of the other movies from this time, you've got a few more familiar faces. Jack Nance is great. Uh, you've got a small role from Mariska Hargitay. Uh, Scott Thompson, who most people probably recognize from one or two of the police academy movies i like his scenes here particularly because you know he went to the audition and they said you seem good but there's a bit in here where we need you to break dance and he said yeah i can do that <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like okay and you watch that scene you're like he couldn't do that <laughs> he, he just know. he just said that to get the part ralph seymour is another one and like he would show up in like Rain Man and things. He's the one who plays Toad Boy. You see him show up in, in a bunch of these movies. He's like a, you know, solid character actor. There was one scene in Ghoulies when I was a kid that always creeped me out completely. There's a clown sitting in a chair in the corner right. and it mm -hmm. just kind of turns over and then a, a slimy lizard like rips open the mouth and comes out of it and it's just like this flapping you're like oh that person's gonna get fucked up <laughs> that scene like it was burned into my brain as a kid well having i think that image of like a hand coming out of someone's mouth like that's just like a weird like lovecraftian yeah horrible like image uh speaking about the the, the effects though because this is john carl beekler who would just become, you know, a dynamo in the 80s on like that lower level. Like he wasn't Rick Baker and he wasn't Chris Wayless and he wasn't Stan Winston, but he was John Beekler and he could do so much magic on a budget. And even though his his puppets here don't get to do as much, you start to kind of get that, that feeling of this is a new vision. You know, this is somebody who's going to do something different. I also love the fact that like when the sorcerer stuff happens, like the green stuff in the eyes, that was all done in camera. Like that hat, like they had contact lenses and and they used black light. And like yeah. the fact that you were able to do that in cameras, like it's it's one of those touches that you go, I didn't even realize how hard that is to do and how innovative that is. And we just kind of take it for granted, making the impossible possible, and then also going, and here's how we did it. That's kind of the the full moon mantra, though, isn't it? Like there's there's so much you would see in this movie that would propagate itself throughout like let's say the Puppet Master movies yep, yep. like John Carl Beekler's like when you watch Ghoulies you definitely see that these are puppets on like rods that are just kind of bouncing around yep, just seventy five to eighty percent of all the Puppet Master movies that's exactly how they articulate all of those things just off screen just kind of moving them around and then if we do look forward to ghoulies because it didn't take six years <laughs> for charles band to crank out a, a sequel he's like no no that made money let's make some more money and uh ghoulies 2 came out uh in in 1987 and it is the gremlins knockoff that you know what some of us wanted ghoulies to be and John Carl Beekler has a budget. Uh, Charles Band has a studio in Italy. And like Ghoulies 2 is just bigger and uh, more energetic in almost every way. And I, as you said, Derek, I think it is more mainstream friendly. I think it is like people can just, they don't have to have seen the first one. In fact, it's almost better that you don't see the first one because you're like, you know, where do these Ghoulies even come from? They never even explain it. They just like some guy, the priest shows up with a bag over his shoulder and he shoves them into like the toxic waste and then doesn't have any effect on them at all. But it's like, that's the introduction to the ghoulies. They're just creatures in a bag. Ready? Go. Yeah, they really did shed that because the first one was so centered on the occult. And, you know, really the only trace, like you said, there was at the beginning, uh, these hooded, these guys in red hoods, you know, are kind of looking for the bag. You know, they don't 
how did the ghoulies get into these into the possession of these people? We don't know, but they just kind of shed it and say, "We're going to the carnival. We're going to the fair." Uh, Kevin, I know that this uh, this is one that you you enjoy as well. Yeah, I, I really like this one. This um, this to me was a, a more generally satisfying film uh, because just really the fun of that central idea of the the haunted house being the setting for these ghoulies to run amok and for people to initially not realize that things that were being put on around them, acts of horror, were real and then still being lured back in and then eventually stuck there as things get worse and worse. Uh, and it helps that, uh, I've got to mispronounce his name, but is it Phil von de Carol? I really like Phil von de Carol. I've liked him since, I think I, I think Troll was before this. Mm-hmm. I think he was in mm-hmm. Troll. Um, he's a he's a great actor that was used well in a number of these films at this time. So he's a great presence here. The creatures seem a little bit better, and I just think the the pacing and the use of the premise is, for me, a little bit more fun and lively. And uh, yeah, I I preferred it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I preferred the first one. <laughs> well, Derek, Derek, since I, I, I'm. Get, what what is your feelings about uh, about uh, Ghoulies too? I love it. I okay. absolutely yeah. love Ghoulies too. And not I, it, yeah, no, I, I and I mean it's funny you say that, Kevin, because I have this conversation a lot because I always feel like I have to be the apologist for Ghoulies one mm. because I, I, the vast majority of people feel the way you do, Kevin, and I'm always that guy in the corner. But, but Ghoulies is good. <laughs> um, so, so I mean, I understand it, but this movie, like w- when it came out, this is an immediate hitter, right? You, it's easy to understand. There's not about a bunch of obtuse like Satanism and occult stuff. Uh, it's not particularly dark. While there are mur- there is murder and there are monsters, it's it's not as in your face like horror as you would expect it to be. It, it is more in lines with the Gremlins, uh, which makes it a more immediate film. But um, in in at that time, I was uh, fully into like hair metal and stuff like that. You got Wasp uh, playing in this movie. Royal Dano's really fun in this movie. Yep. Yeah. Um, as you had said, like the, the effects work is also really fun. The Ghoulies do a hell of a lot more. And of course, being monster kids, you're in a haunted house in a spooky carnival. So yeah, it's like the perfect environment for for a silly ass movie like this. So it, I love Ghoulies too. It's great. It's a lot of fun. As you said, Kevin, the idea of like that haunted house where bad things actually happen and it's easy to be taken unaware because you think it's all an illusion. And then suddenly you find out, nope, nope, they're actually trying to kill you. Like I think that's that's a great uh device and it's been used successfully a number of times not nearly as much as you would think it would be you know like that doesn't feel like something that's been played out uh something that really struck me was that uh charles band is shooting at his at the studio in italy that entire carnival is on a soundstage like none of the exteriors are actually exteriors like it's all happening (laughs) inside and i just found that incredible i'm like now, the one thing was that the, the, the plus was that you're on a soundstage. The downside was they had to bring all of those carnival rides in from other places, like actual carnivals. And so that that drove the, the budget up a little bit. I love, you know, like when the gremlins are just running amok at, in the final reel and like they're un, unscrewing things off the, 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 the spin around thing and uh, they're running people over with bumper cars. I'm like, this is awesome to go back to your point really quick Derek I like ghoulies now I can appreciate it for the movie it is as opposed to the movie I thought it was going to be uh whereas ghoulies 2 is absolutely the movie I thought it was going to be and then some I think we have five right we have five ghoulies you know that we got a bat a cat uh, a lizard a the green bald one green what it, yeah it's, it's <laughs> yeah. Like a weird baby the monster. toilet guy yeah, the toilet guy. <laughs> I'm 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 going to go profoundly deeper d- deeper here than I intended to for Ghoulies too. But <laughs> I I detected some clever reflexive humor here in the sense that you have this failing haunted house, uh, and they don't know how to make a buck, and then suddenly they start 
making all this money because all the people word of mouth is spreading that all the little monsters are at the haunted house. Therefore yep. the little monsters sell. And the little monsters sell, right? I mean, that is what we were finding is like after gremlins, we saw a lot of little, little monsters hitting the screens, large and small, uh, because those little monsters, cause also you could merchandise that yep. Royal Dano in this and then killer clowns. I'm just like, you know, like give that guy, you know, whatever, whatever award he, he, he wants. <laughs> Cause he's just so much fun. As good as John Glover was in Gremlins too. I really like the uh, slimy business owner in this one. And his famous scene is, is the highlight they kind of sold on. Yes. Ghoulies 2 is a film I like now as much as when I first saw it as a kid. And Ghoulies is a film that I've started to enjoy more as I can, as you said, see it for what it is rather than what I sort of thought it would be. So I, I grew up in a state fair town and I remember how crappy haunted houses were with carnivals. Um, they were always on these tracks and then these little things would just kind of pop out and a light would shine on them. And I always love it how, well, in any film for that matter, a haunted house at a fair is like something that's crafty with practical magic effects and things like that. And so in, I just enjoyed this sort of uh, walkable haunted house where they had uh, a pit in the pendulum prop with an actual blade. <laughs> um, yep. Because why not? You have to be authentic. And uh, the ghoulies utilized that later to tie up somebody uh, where he almost died. So, uh, yeah, I'd say any scene in this haunted house, I just had a blast. I'm in, I'm with Dodd completely. Is it, it, The haunted house in general is just especially as a kid something that uh is such a good vibe for these kind of movies and and to tie it into ghoulies and again like that not to get super profound about this or anything like that is, is it. that it's just like so brilliant to like try and market this while this and ghoulies one definitely are horror movies leaning towards a more adult audience they they obviously leaned into the fact that the little monster craze with kids was big and let's not let's not be um like intellectually dishonest about this is that these movies were marketed towards kids mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely why do you think i became obsessed with it when i was little those cover the box arts absolutely i mean ghoulies too literally it had the toy but it had more ghoulies all over it <laughs> so so i mean that that uh, convergence of yeah, right exactly right there, the convergence of the monster and the kid, uh, and the kitty like um, like the haunted house, which is real enough, but not necessarily real. I also thought it was always really funny that the pit and the pendulum, like the pendulum, actually was a blade. Like they would ever have that be a thing, and it wouldn't be just like a cardboard chromed cutout thing it's, like, it's so ridiculous but yeah that's for me it's kind of like do you guys remember did you ever see um i believe it was was it leprechaun 2 where they had uh the, they had the two shyster guys that would do the hollywood haunted tours and drive around uh, like taking people's money and the leprechaun yeah. shows up in the mix of that they're like these two movies for some reason tie together for me like in that in the vibe department like i love that kind of shystery carnival aspect of both of those i'm happy to hand the uh, floor over to derek and, and kevin <laughs> since i know they have walked that path so any any quick thoughts on uh on ghoulies three and four uh i've i've spent many months since trying to wipe them from my mind <laughs> i I know they have their fans. I get. I think I can't remember if it's immediately obvious in three, but certainly by four, you can see the lazier shortcuts for the for the the creatures and the movement, and it's it's really off putting. They start leaning more into the the comedy already, and it's almost um, yeah, it's it's almost the case of action happening and then people holding puppets into frame just to give a little wiggle and putting sound effects over them. And I was I was not a fan, but I know there are some fans. I, I don't know if, if Derek feels kinder towards them than I do. No, Ghoulies Go to College is like, they tried to go more comedy with, with the franchise and it just falls flat on its face. The Ghoulies are actually much bigger 
in that movie for some unknown reason. They're like, I, and I think it's because they they put little people in the costumes instead of having mm. puppets to have them more articulate. And it just Ghoulies Three. I know there are fans of it. I know there's a lot of a lot of people out there that you know, that kind of find it charming. I it never did anything for me. And Ghoulies Four, which is a straight up like Jim Wynorski piece of fucking absolute garbage yes. is is it, and the funny thing is the the tie i mean it basically has almost nothing to do with the franchise it's its own thing the lead character from part one our lead satanist is a cop now the slumber party massacre movies and the sword house massacre movies jim wynorski basically somehow like tied those two franchises together using footage as opposed to any real ties to the two franchises and it feels like he's doing the same thing in part four where he just made his own goddamn movie tossed a couple people that looked like trolls in there and then uh had one of the actors from the first movie come in it is disconnected totally unnecessary and perhaps one of the worst sequels of all time all right well there you go <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I I know I know at some point I will walk that path, and uh, I'll I'll have you two to kind of commiserate with. And I have to ask really quick: so Ghoulies three go to college? There was no clever commentary about academia there or any subtext. <laughs> you could, I suppose, if you really paid attention, if you were paying attention to it in any sort of way, which is really difficult to be honest. Well, cool. Well, thank you all so much. This was this was delightful. I love hanging out with the Rubber Monsters, and I love hanging out with fans of Rubber Monsters. Uh, we'll have you on again very soon. And until next time, keep searching, keep exploring, and keep sharing the scare.